What's your experience been with um, players moving teams in the NBL? Because it's well, very different. I reckon I wouldn't rule it out happening in due time. I just don't think the salaries uh, compete with it right now, right? Like if mm. you've got a guy that's on 80, 90, $100,000 to be able to uh, do it, like it's just impossible to uproot a family or, you know, yes. like yep. rip up a, a rental agreement <laughs> for that. Um there's always been talk, and, and especially around this time, you know, like AFL, and we said, like, what would happen if NBL would you, you know, would you be up and, and against it? There's been even from the NBL Players Association discussing, uh, discussions around that. But I don't think um, you had a point, right? Like, if you had marquee guys and contracts that are maybe like two or three years. Mm. Funny story, uh, and it, it's not really shared. Well, it wouldn't be really shared. So, Matt Nielsen uh, actually spoke about this when he was. As a uh, former Perth Wildcats assistant coach. Assistant coach, now current Spurs. San Antonio Spurs assistant coach. But um, when he was 18, 19, he was with the Sydney Kings and he was, um, you know, uh, you know he, he missed training sessions because he was down at Penrith on Mad Monday celebrating. <laughs> <laughs> um, and one of the most, inc- like, just genuine human beings in the world, one of the funnest guys. But he was telling us that at that time as an 18, 19 year old guy, I was sort of at this, this crossroads <laughs> of career, like, where's he at? And the Sydney Kings actually reached out to the Perth Wildcats and offered him as a trade. Like they said, we want to, uh, you sign Matt Nielsen and we want Scott Fisher. Um, oh, yeah, wow. And I'm pretty sure, I, and were, it was never going to happen because there was never any trade. So it was sort of like this. It's just like a handshake. Under the table. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. like take this guy, this young kid, um, and like, and I think the Wildcats didn't even maintain it because they were like, Matt Nielsen, like 18, 19, Scott Fisher, like yeah. a pioneer of yeah. know, <laughs> the, the NBL at that time. In essence, like Nelly ended up being one of the greatest NBL players and one of the most revered Sydney Kings players of all time. So it's sort yep. of yep. like really ironic, but I even just like would marvel to think how does that conversation even happening? But he only found out like from a comment, it wasn't like his ownership group. And then he sort of was like so, so insulted. Like, are they really trading me? Or it could have been <laughs> even the way Walcott's may have approached Sydney or something yeah, like right. that. So, um, but to think like back however many years ago that a trade could have happened and it would have been this like incre- the one-off NBL yeah. trade of all time. So yeah. yeah, it's pretty funny. And and I think when you talk trade movements or off-season movements, you think about there's only about six or eight prominent agents in the NBL. And yeah, so, right. you know, it's even like when you're talking uh, contracts, you're like, you know where you're at the pecking order. I remember when I, like I had an agent, Jeff McGuire, and he would have, you know, maybe, let's just say example, he's like uh, Todd Blanfield, Mitch Creek, um, Finn Delaney and uh, Thomas Abercrombie. So you're like, <laughs> I have to wait for <laughs> the, all these guys yeah. to get signed. And I was speaking to a guy in the off-season this year where he was basically going uh, at that time, uh, Todd, Todd Blanchfield just, you know, shopping himself around every single club and going around. And it was like the domino effect that he was like, man, he's getting a way better deal and yep. I'm going to have to wait till yep. he signs. So mm. it's a sort of bit with the NBO and the Australian landscape, like it's like even agents knowing what that is. And as Did you that make know. it hard? Because, yeah, there's only a handful of agents and a few more are trying to get into it now. Like even Ben Simmons' brother is setting up an agency and yep. really trying to get a foothold because it's been just a couple of powerful agents, hasn't it, for so long? Down Mate, there. absolutely. And I mean, it's... Yeah, I mean, you've you've got you know, Daniel Moldovan and his group and the Mogul group and, and, and you are starting to get it a bit, a bit distinct. But I think they'll always have that control because if a guy's established, like, here's Moldovan's, like, sort of key, do you want to be Josh Giddy? You know, yeah. like, here's that selling point and that's tough, right, in the Australian yeah. market. So, but it definitely, when I was playing, you're sort of, like, looking at that and going realistically the agent is going you know like if you're competing at two guys in their percentage you know and i can get 150 for him and 110 yeah. i'm trying to chase more for this guy because yeah. i know i'm going to make more money and so you're sort of sitting there hence why in my last year in my last four or five years i was like i'm realistically um i knew the landscape and it's changed so much because the salary cap sort of changed up but i was like i know my ceiling i know where i'm at well i know my floor i didn't have an agent i had a uh, i consulted legal advice in terms of the contract matters but i was like i'm gonna save money here like yeah. realistically and um yeah one year i was a free agent uh rob beverage was a coach and so basically um he just hit me up personally because he knew me and I was like, all right, I'll just negotiate here and um, use that to my advantage. Like, okay, I went straight back to Oxford. This is what I'm getting. So, saved myself a 7.5% agency. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, very good. You know, uh, was able to negotiate it that way.